morning we're going to do things that, uh, differently. I'm going to do something that I'd never done before, before the half past nine service. So I've done it once and it seemed to go okay. You'll be pleased, pleased to know. Uh, and what it is, is to, this, today's subject is Pentecost. And I wasn't down to preach on Pentecost. It was David Hudson who was down to preach on Pentecost. And just to get out of it, you had a stroke, which that's going to extremes. And he hasn't recovered yet, so therefore he's not going to be preaching this morning. I asked another couple of people last week if they wanted to preach, and they said, what, five days notice, or just get lost, basically? <laughs> so you've got me. And I started thinking about Pentecost, and I looked back at my, my notes and my diaries and realised that three out of the past five years I stood here and preached on Pentecost Sunday. And I was chatting to God about this, because it's quite good to chat to God, I find, in these matters. And God said, well, let's do it differently, Rob. So if you want a normal sermon on Pentecost, go on the website and find mine from last year, or I can send you my notes from most of them. But that's not what's going to happen this morning. I was chatting to God and mulling over what should take place this morning. God said, well, just look at what happened at Pentecost. These guys and girls were all sat there waiting on me, and the Holy Spirit came, and I filled them, I enabled them, and they spoke, and everybody heard in their own language. And to paraphrase that, they spoke, and everybody heard what God wanted them to hear. And God said to me, that's what I want you to do. So don't prepare anything, so no notes for the first time in 33 years of preaching. I'll speak, hopefully filled by the Holy Spirit, so bear that in mind. I have to say hopefully, and I like your prayers on that. And hopefully you guys will hear what God wants you to hear on this subject. Now that was quite scary for me, that concept. So believe it or not, I've probably spent more time preparing this sermon than I do prepare most sermons. Because what I've done is spend lots of time in prayer. And I was uh, praying on Thursday, and as I was praying on Thursday, God said to me, oh, why don't you spend some time praying on the platform? So I came down to church on Friday morning, and I spent some time praying on this platform on Friday morning. And as I was here praying and walking around and just asking God to help me, big H, uh, one thing he said was, uh, phone Phil Porter. Uh, and it wasn't for a round of golf or to talk about Liverpool or something. It was actually about the, the service. And he said, ask Phil to, to be available. Phil is a guy who has a, 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 what's probably what we refer to in church as, a, as a, a gift of prophecy, where he hears from God very accurately uh, for people's lives. So I asked Phil if he would come along and sit. And instead of really listening to watch anything else that was going on, just to listen to God and pray over the congregation during the service. He did that during the first service, and God is a good God and uses his servants faithfully. And Phil had six different words of knowledge for six different people in the service. After the service, five different people that came up to him that he'd picked out. This wasn't vague, this was picking out people's names. And they came up to him afterwards, and five of them said, that was exactly correct for my situation. And the other person hasn't yet confirmed it, hasn't come to Phil yet, They're probably terrified. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is because I've asked Phil to do that again in this service. So as well as me just talking, we're also going to do, I'm going to do it uh, once or twice or whatever often. Phil's going to jump up, jump up here, and he's going to share with you some words of prophecy. That is obviously if God gives him any words of prophecy. We cannot control God in that manner. I've got an armband that's on my hand, or on my wrist, and it says, take a risk for Jesus. And I believe this morning that I am taking a risk for Jesus, but I'm doing it in my church family. And if it all goes pear-shaped, hey, we'll get on, won't we? We'll survive. But I must admit, I look round at some people, and I see some people's faces that I have given words of prophecies for over the years. One of them that I don't know why I'm going to share this, but I am, that's how it goes, is I'm looking at, at, at Leslie Scott, who she was in my, my joined the church and joined my cell group. And the very first night I had a, a prophecy for her and a picture 
and a picture of her wearing a, a, a bright red nose. This was the first time I'd met this woman. And I thought, that's a really strange thing to have a picture of, this lovely, delicate lady. And uh, I shared it with Leslie. I said, Leslie, I've got this picture and I've got these words. And I shared the picture and she said, do you know what I do? And I said, what I do, you work at Tesco's and, and uh, at the petrol station, I've seen you there a couple of times. She said, no, no, that's how I earn money. I'm a clown. That's what I am, I'm, I'm a clown. I thought, no. And she said, yeah. Remember that, Leslie? Yeah. And when God does these things, you know it's from God. Because you know it's not in your power. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So, Pentecost. As I was thinking about this, what came into my head as I was sat in the toilet five minutes ago was the, the Disney film Aladdin. Have you ever seen the Disney film Aladdin? And uh, what you have is you have this massive big, um, uh, what's it called? Genie. You have this massive big genie and, and he lives in a tiny little uh, bottle, Disney or whatever it is, bottle, that'll do. Uh, and in the, in the film he, he says this, this line, he says, cosmic power, any when you live in space, as he says that in this film. And I want to transfer that across to something a bit more spiritual now. And I want you to think of the concept of what we're looking at this morning, which is Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now as Christians, we believe that the New Testament clearly states, and let me tell you, it does in many places, but Romans 8 verse 9 or Ephesians 1 13 or Ephesians 4 30, many other places it'll tell you clearly that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into you. In fact, Romans 8 says that if you haven't got the Holy Spirit inside you, you are not a Christian. Ephesians 1 says that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that's not very heavy, deep, hard theology. That's very fundamental theology. That as Christians, we have God inside us. That's what the Bible says. You have God inside you. Which made me think of Aladdin, or maybe the other way around. Can you imagine that? Cosmic power, the awesome God, the creator of the world, omniscient, all knowing, that is, all knowing. And yet the Bible says that when you become a Christian, you are sealed with God, God the Holy Spirit. That God the Holy Spirit is in your heart. And you're not a Christian if you haven't got God inside you. <coughs> that one level, that's dead easy to comprehend. Yeah, that's okay. I accept that though. And the Bible says it all over the place. I'm a Christian, I've got the Holy Spirit inside me. But I would beg to differ that for the majority of us, for the majority of our days on this earth, we don't come to terms with that. Because it's uncomprehensible. How can Jenny have God inside her and be sat there. Why is she not exploding? <laughs> yeah, she's got God inside her. Have you got God inside you? Is that what you believe? You Christians, you actually believe that. You're telling me that as you walk about your daily life, that when you go to work, you're telling me that you profess to have God inside you. That's what you're saying. So Scott Cost is telling me when he's advising these wealthy folk in Santander, if you're wealthy, Scott's the guy, yeah? <coughs> you know, when he's advising these people, he has God inside him. That's the claim that he's making. And they also want to back up that claim. Here's the question for you, and I think actually.
We all accept the theory that we've got the Holy Spirit in us. But would any journey convict you? Can you imagine being up in a... Yeah. You know, I'm going to pick your arm. <laughs> I've got to be honest with you, I was drawn to Simon Parker. I was, uh, you know, you know, Simon's been accused. He's been accused by some of his colleagues of having the Holy Spirit inside him. He has said that he is God inside him. That's what the judge has got to decide upon. And he's in court. And the judge says to him, okay, where's your defense lawyer? What is the evidence? Prove to me that God's inside you. Where is it revealed? Show me the difference. Show me the difference that having God inside you makes to your life, makes you different from Joe Bloggs. Are we going to get convicted? Are we going to get convicted? Because we're told in Acts chapter 1 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you. And you know, I think we're pretty good at concealing it. A.W. <coughs> e. Kauser says in his book that, that uh, Christians should be leaking. He said the reason we have to be refilled or re-immersed or re-baptized is because we're leaking. Because we should be using the power. When we use the power, we then need to recharge the battery. But there's another solution as well. If you just get that battery of power and just sit there and don't use it and go back to three months time, it will still be dead. You know, we need to recharge because of two choices. Because we're using it or because we're not using it. But either way, we need to be recharged and refilled. But there's the question. What is the criteria for you for needing to be refilled this morning? I am convinced that all of us need more of God in our, in our hearts. That more of our lives need to be giving over to God. And we need more power of the Holy Spirit in our lives this morning. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because you've been using it every day for the past week. And just like Jesus, he goes away and has a quiet time with God and recharges his batteries. Or whether it's because he's been dormant for the past year and it's just dwindled another way. But if you're a Christian this morning, you have God inside you. Could you explain that to somebody at work? Your neighbor? Could you explain how you've got God inside you? Because I tell you what, it's a really, really strange concept, isn't it? But that's fundamental. It's fundamental. And we can look at other religions and think they're weird and wonderful. I've been told by my wife, and I've been told by John, the warden, that I've got to try and avoid being weird this morning. So I'll try and stick to being wonderful, right? But the Christian faith is weird and wonderful. What we did before, not common parlance in 21st century Britain, is it? But you know, we need to be different. We cannot conform to society. Society needs changing. And it's changing by the power of God flowing through us. And that's what happened in Acts. Hang on a second. I tell you what, Phil, you come and talk for a minute. Maybe anything? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I think what I'll do, I actually shared something at 9.30, and I'll share it again because it is on my heart. I do have, I think, some prophetic words from God, which I'll share a little later. But just speaking into what Rob has said so far, um, we, as you will probably know, run the disciple. <laughs> Shit, of course. <laughs> Seamlessly. Um, and, and we spend all of our time on the discipleship course. We spend a lot of our time um, not necessarily teaching people theology. Um, we do do that. We spend time teaching them who they are, how God sees you. Um, because all this stuff that Rob's talking about having God in us, it doesn't work if you don't know who you are. Um, there's the phrase that sounds really good. Uh, there are two types of people, sinners and forgiven sinners. 
and he will all sit there and nod and go, yeah, that's true. Sounds good and Christian. And, and I think it's nonsense. I think it's rubbish. And I think it's stuff that gets spoken over the church for generation after generation and causes you, people who have the living God inside you, to sit there like that. Because the truth is there are sinners and there are saints. There are sinners and there are princes and princesses. All capable of sinning. But your starting point is that you're a saint. And you may sin in the process. You're not a sinner who may be a saint in the process. Uh, and as Rob's talking, if you can have that in your head, you, know, you need people to pay attention to you. You need people to see you. This whole thing, you know, look at me. Look at me. Now look at God. If you can't get people's attention, God's not going to get their attention because as Rob said, he's living in us. You know, we're in the middle of a, a study uh, on the fruit of the Spirit. We've done four. We're not doing goodness. Goodness and kindness we've kind of linked together. And we've got four more. And in the middle of this is this week, week five. And the idea of the fruit of the Spirit is a very simple idea. It's the idea that, that as we live with God, His personality comes out in us. It's not, not rocket science, that, is it? You know, as, as God is in us, as the Holy Spirit is in us, as His power is revealed in us, His personality is revealed in us. So the closer we walk with God, the more like God we are. Well, that's not rocket science. The more like God we are, the more the fruit of the Spirit will be revealed. That's not rocket science. And guess what? The more the fruit of the Spirit is revealed, the more we'll draw people to God, because they'll be like that. God's quite an attractive character. So actually, it all stems from us and God being hand in hand. And what God does with that, he says, not only will I rub off on you, but I'll give you presents. We call these presents gifts. In the Bible we call them gifts of the Spirit. It's God giving us presents. Because God likes us and he gives us presents. So I'm going to give you presents from me. So gifts from God, gifts of the Spirit. To help you transform the world. That's very handy that, isn't it? And how do you exercise these gifts? Well you stay close to God and let God channel his gifts through you. And that's what Phil's doing this morning. God's given them the gift of prophecy where God tells them things. Well, we expect that. I expect God to speak to me. But what, what Phil gets is very specific stuff for specific people. And he takes a risk. He wears the armband and he says, I'm going to take a risk. But through time and living with God, he's found time and time again that he's bang on with his prophecies, which is dead exciting. So these disciples, day one, they're there, and we're told, how many people changed their mind about God on that first day? One sermon, how many people changed their mind and thought, I fancy a bit of that? Any idea? I have 3,000. 3,000 people became Christians because of their sermon, because of, to be honest, they've got no idea what they said. You know, because of the power of God flowing through them. 3,000 people. That's a decent jump in the church size, isn't it? We could cope with that. Let's could we cope with that? Financially wise, that'd be good. We could do with that. What was spiritually wise? Spiritually wise, 3,000 people filled with the Spirit, excited the power of God being revealed to other Christians. Wow, what can we do? What can we do if we had a church filled with Christians like that. Hey? Instead of us, Lord. Hey? What could we do if we had a few of these fantastic Christians in our church? Then, then God could do some real business. But it's only got us. So what's, what does that mean then? It's only got us. This is it. This is, a, this is God's army for Christ's church. So, what do we do then? Do we give up? Because we, we haven't got any of these superstar Christians who are going to transform the world? 
Or maybe God got it right. But maybe because God said you, you are the person. You are the person that's going to transform your world. You see, one of the things that, that, that I've been mulling over is this, this concept that I don't think we really comprehend the fact that we've got God in us. We're far happy with the idea of praying out to God and God touching us. But God's out there and he comes, in, comes into our presence. He, he touches us or we pray to him. And that concept is a very Jewish concept. It's not unbiblical, it fits in, but it's about the concept of praying out to God. I've got no problem with it, as long as you understand that we've also got God in here. And when you really understand that you've got God in here, then you really understand that we, individually and collectively, are phenomenal people. What other choice have we got? We have God in us. Therefore, the potential power of God is available to us. You know, I, one night this week I started reading Acts and I just enjoyed it. I just read the whole book and I worry because it's a good book to read. You know, a lot better than Mills and Boone. You know, I so that than Mills and Boone, but anyway. And as I read it, I realised it, and I, I read it, and I went back and checked some things. And the disciples, the followers of Christ, not just the disciples, Agabus and all, all the followers of Christ that are mentioned in Acts, never once, never once, did they ever beg or ask of God to do miraculous things. And you think, oh, I thought. I thought Acts was filled with miraculous things. Yeah, it is. Miracles take place in every single chapter of Acts, apart from Acts 17. Mm. Sorry about that. But 31 chapters, miracles take place in every single chapter. But every time that a disciple declares God's glory, they just declare God's glory. I mean, Paul at the end of Acts, that was in Acts 28, when he's marooned, uh, shipwrecked uh, on, on Crete, and, and, and he comes, not oh, Crete, Malta, sorry, he's shipwrecked, and, and was told that everybody in the island came to Paul, and he healed them all. And we get the example, you can look at this yourself, look at it in the, in the, the Gospels, look at it in Acts, every single time, they just declare healing. They don't beg. They don't say ifs or buts. Peter and John, Acts chapter 3, I think it is, going to pray at the temple and they meet the blind man and he says, give me money. Peter says, no, but in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lazarus get up and walk. And he gets up and walks. That's just it. The attitude is unbelievable. The attitude revealed by Jesus, revealed by the disciples, revealed throughout the New Testament. It's an attitude that I don't think I have. So the question is, am I wrong or, or is the Bible wrong? Now, I know it's still a bit hard and it's hard to believe, but I think on this occasion, it could be wrong, but it's wrong. Where's my glass? And maybe we need to start changing our attitude to better attitudes. You have God within you. God wanting to burst out of you. That's got to start changing your mind in some way. Don't get me wrong. But my experience tells me that I've prayed for lots of people to be healed. And many of them haven't been healed. But many of them have. And my understanding is I need to pray for more. And I've seen some phenomenal miracles take place. You know, with God's power flowing through me. And I don't blame God for the ones that are not. I don't understand it. But I keep on going. Phil. So as Rob said, I've been I've been listening, um, and I might be completely wrong. I may share a word of knowledge or a prophecy, uh, what I think, and it could just be me. So, uh, and I'm okay with that. It doesn't bother me. If it doesn't bother you. Uh, what I would say in particular about prophecy 
is just remember that the prophetic is speaking into your future. So I may tell you now, or if somebody comes to prayer, I may pray with you, I may describe something that, that means nothing to you. That's because it could be the prophetic. Uh, what would say is hold on to it, pray about it, find others that might give some confirmation, see what happens in time, and, and if something does happen in time and it makes you think back to this, that's the point at which you give thanks to God and you have some sense of assurance that this is God's plan. Um, words of knowledge are, are just words that are describing somebody's life uh, in a way that convinces you, hopefully, that it's God. Because um, how would that person know that? It's something that has happened. Prophecy is something that will happen. Um, so there's uh, nine. Share your faith um, and you'll make disciples too. Uh, Wendy, on the front. Um, what I sensed was um, God saying that you doubt your goodness and your compassion. You doubt yourself as both a mum and a wife at times. Um, and He wants to reassure you that you have been the very best um, on all accounts. And you have loving service to your family for years to come. So don't doubt who you have been because he doesn't. Um, I can't get one of them because it's youth and they're upstairs. So I'll do that after. Somebody at the back of the church, and this, is, this was non-specific, I apologise. It's just that way. Um, felt as though time is just running too fast. You can never catch up with yourself. Um, and if that means anything to you, God is saying, just stop and pray some more. It's counterintuitive. You feel you've got to keep going because you're just going to lose everything. I'm actually saying, no, don't. Do less. Just spend time with me. Um, gentlemen, glasses and the white top and straps, yeah. Um, I felt as though God was saying that uh, the person would say, welcome. Um, you have a home and the teaching gift in particular that you have is something that could bless and will bless many churches. Um, the gentleman, two rows from the back, I feel as though God was just saying, choose me. Choose me, I'm here, I'm waiting. Listen to my knock, what Jenny was saying earlier. Uh, and then two more that actually I got last night when I was praying. I, I'll be honest, one of them is a little odd. It just doesn't make any sense to me, only because of, of who it is. But God said that there's a couple that's going to be in church today, and the man's going to be in green and the woman's going to be in yellow. <laughs> there happens to be a man in green and a woman in yellow over there. Um, but what it said was that you, you have a calling to work with the disabled as a couple. Don't doubt the call uh, and listen. So, uh, and the last one I have is Kate, who isn't here. I'll speak to Kate afterwards then. So there you go. I'll say you too. You know, I want to thank Phil for doing that. It's risky what Phil is doing. We're church family. Phil's been part of this church family for 20, must be 20 years, 19, 20 years after the time. You know, this is a, a, a place where, to be honest, it really shouldn't be risky. All we're doing is telling you what we believe God said. That shouldn't be a, a risky thing to do. But I trust in, it, in his guidance and, and, and Obviously, you know, it doesn't mean that every single time that Phil has a prophecy is bang on, but my experience is, it nearly always is. So if you receive something, please pray about it, chat to somebody you know well, chat to God, chat to Phil, and do something with that information. 
want to, within reason, draw a, a time to a, an end. Now. I want to just make one final, <coughs> final point. Uh, and that point is that, you know, we've discussed a lot about the, 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 the power of, of God. And we've had it revealed in Pentecost, the potential there. And I want to encourage us all to make a decision this morning to start increasing the power flowing in our lives. Make a decision, although this is definitely scary, to add control over to God. This God that is inside of the all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God who indwells us. But as Jenny says, you know, it's not forceful in what he does to, to turn that power over. Uh, Michael Green in his book on, on baptism talks about being, being filled with the Holy Spirit and having the power of the Holy Spirit being released. And he refers to having a, a sports car which that latent power is there but the engine's not been turned on to, to utilise it. And I want to encourage this morning to, to make a step of, of turning that engine on and saying, yeah, I want God's power released in me. I know it's there. I know, understand the theory, but the practice is maybe a little, be a little bit weak. So I want to turn on that engine and I want God's power to be flowing through me and out of me so that we can be the ambassadors. We can be the prince and princesses. We can be the representatives that Christ needs us to be. Because God's plan is that he flows through us to transform this world. We increase his kingdom by his power flowing through us. That's the, that's, that's the great commission. And that's your great commission. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Heather to come up and just play uh, some music for us. And I, I've asked a few people to come forward to be willing to pray over anybody. And I want to ask you, as Heather is, is playing some music, if you want to... You know, come forward and just well, you can do it if you want. It. Just recommit, you know, uh, you know, to you know, to be refilled, to be reanointed, to be to have that engine turned on, to have that power flowing through you, to be the person that God wants you to be, to step over the line and say, I want to be your witness, I want to be your ambassador, I want to be your princess, I want that power to be flowing in me, through me, and out of me. If any of that is where you're at this morning, I'd encourage you just to come forward to the front. And there'll be people here happy and willing and desirous to pray for you and just to encourage you. If you don't want to do that, you know, that's fine. Still make that commitment yourself. But as church family, let's get involved with each other. So as Heather's going to, I don't know what Heather's going to do, but Heather's going to do some stuff over there. And the prayer team that I've asked will come out to the front here, please. Uh, let's come to the front. Let's not do it across in the corner. I'd like you right across the front because this is public exciting stuff and we'll just have a five, five, ten minutes.